kept you waiting, didn't I? Standing here. I honestly never thought I'd see the day. The day that I would hold in my hands to be able to review a translated Super Robot Wars game. Several of them! I even found copies of the original Generations anime in frickin' Cybuster online. I've had some good luck finding Super Robot material the last couple of years. Yeah, the Super Robot Tyson, or rather, Super Robot Wars series is sadly not given its due in the Western market. They are one of Namco Bandai's long-running franchises. Started in 1991 by one of their subsidiary developers most known under the name Ben Presto. With the games being tactical RPGs crossing over every mecha series they can, and sometimes just sci-fi and space opera properties that might bear power armor or special ship units like Tekkenman Blade, Cowboy Bebop, and Star Blazers, that Bandai has the licensing rights to produce merchandise for, or sometimes given special permission to include, as is the case with an entry that featured Takara's Zoid properties. Though normally these are done in collaboration with Sunrise, since Sunrise is, and shall likely remain, the kings of giant robot anime. Even though there really have not been many good giant robot anime, or even series involving giant robots since the early side of the 2010s. Really, there haven't been. The list of what's good or bad the last decade is ultimately very subjective and inconsistent depending on taste. Only the uninformed say the genre is dying, but there's a lot less engagement than there once was, partly because the stuff doesn't get the attention it used to if there is no existing audience for it, as Bandai Entertainment used to be the main importer of such series and gave them equal attention, and that Bandai division has been dead a decade and killed due to Bandai of America's own incompetence. The situation with Funimation outright burying the recent series back arrow so most people didn't watch it is a good example of how just series are treated now. The main Western anime importer actively shuns those shows if they don't already have a built-in audience, but they end up taking the license rights anyways, so those who would promote it and make bank off of them, such as Sentai Filmworks, Discotech Media, Nozomi Entertainment, Media Blasters, or even Crunchyroll, can't then get it to that audience. Though, God forbid one of those shows gets taken by Anaplex, as then no one will give it attention because of how heavily Anaplex US and price gouges their home video sets. Eh. At least Dinozedon got attention. But for a list of what's been there, almost every Mobile Suit Gundam series, Macross, The Brave Franchise, Big O, Getarobo, Gurren Lagann, Code Geass, Mazager, Votoms, Martian Successor, Nadesico, I can honestly go on with what's been represented and mashed up over the years into these games, as it is almost every Japanese series with a robot or power armor, giant or otherwise, in it that they can manage to mash in. If your series has gotten into a Super Robot Wars game, you've made it to Japanese pop culture notoriety, for good and for bad. I first discovered the games thanks to YouTube in 2006, as players of the games have put montages of all the characters' attacks and tandem moves up on the platform since its beginning. And it's actually to my own embarrassment, they only in 2019 discovered that they'd started to import the games in 2016 to the Asian English markets. And to a lot of people... Super Robot Wars is regarded as high-concept, officially licensed crossover fanfiction. Not helped that as someone who appreciates fan works when they're done well, I've seen some of the Super Robot Wars' franchise scenarios done by fanfic writers. And, well, I hold them as examples as how such should be done when playing with other people's works as part of your own. As in my experience, they endeavor to bring out the best elements of each of the involved series, and in the mass crossover not only succeed in integrating the Divergent series' canons and lore into feeling like a natural, amalgamated setting of the story they want to tell, most of the time, they do so without screwing up the depiction of, significantly retconning, or deriding the respective series stories and lore. Again, most of the time. All of which is not an easy thing to do, considering the just sheer volume of things that have screwed it up because they all fail proper research and awareness of the material they are using. 
While there are story divergences from the original canons as part of fitting them all into the amalgamated universe for the grander story presented, and allowing their experiences to change with such applying to them, what is changed is usually done with intent to mediate, fix, or downplay widely accepted flaws and failings in the source material, while retaining most to all of their good elements. And by doing so, it allows them to present them in their best and most character-respecting interpretations, again, most of the time, there are some areas where they don't do the best at this, instead of arrogantly presuming a series or character in it to be something which they weren't to begin with which is the failing of many writers and producers these days for many speculative fiction, fantasy, and superhero properties where a creator who knows nothing about the franchise comes in and screws it all up. Hell, some of these divergences are facilitated by the crossover itself in their world fusion to prevent an unnecessary bad end, and even at times call out the nonsense of some of their creators' worst and indefensibly bad decisions as just that, while providing a better alternative a creator just might not have seen as possible in their original series, or been blind to do their own biases and writing quirks. Well, not every game fully achieves this. I have heard horror stories about Z3 where they didn't succeed in tying everything they had together or resolving them fully. This franchise is resultantly one of the few involving series crossovers or changing hands away from the property's original creators that does not fail to respect the core source material or characters, or majorly conflict with prior established concepts that made people actually give a damn and be invested in it. If the fans like something about a series, the writers of the games try to understand why they liked it and embrace that, and not spitefully subvert or go against that for what their own vision would be, which has been the failing of many creators in recent years who have attempted to play in another person's already established sandbox, or change what they themselves made to make it worse. Though, no, unfortunately, if your preferred character pairing wasn't canon, or ended up being made non-canon by a later story edition, which moves things in a contrarian direction to what was expected or previously established, yeah, they're not screwing with that. So carry on making your stories, AU ship it thick riders! But there has to be a reason such an amazing series has never been imported or given Asian English versions before the last few years outside of the odd random original generations game, right? Well, Bandai said the reason is rights issues caused by licensing conflicts. In specific, the rights and licensing conflicts caused by Harmony Gold. Despite Bandai holding a master rights license for any merchandise or games relating to the properties they produce products for on an international level, or otherwise license the right to use them in the game series, well, as anyone who's gotten a content ID claim on YouTube knows, copyright law with regards to right to use is all screwed up. So when an anime distribution company licenses a series from Japan, or otherwise picks up the rights, that company can end up having a say in the distribution of products based on that content, depending on how the license was issued. So they can get a kickback from tie-in merchandise. This is actually why you saw a lot of Bandai video game tie-ins to anime in the 2000s. Bandai still had a big stake in handling those things via their own anime distribution division, or other companies wanting that kickback or promotion. But in this specific case, legal precedent hamstrung Bandai from enforcing the right to export the games, and that was caused thanks to Harmony Gold. Harmony Gold in the 1980s licensed the series Super Dimensional Fortress Macross, Super Dimension Cavalry Southern Cross, and Genesis Collider Mos Spada for use in making their series Robotech, and have held their license in a stranglehold ever since. Their abuse of those intellectual property rights is very well documented and affected a wide host of other series, including preventing the rest of the sequels to the original Macross, which spans an entire franchise on its own, from seeing any legal distribution in the West, which their owners are not happy about as since they can't get it exported, they're not making any more Macross entries anymore. That is with exception to solely the OVA series Macross Plus and Macross's second compilation movie, which Manga Entertainment managed to snap up the one time Harmony Gold slipped on their license renewal. But their license is no longer active, and everyone that's tried to do more failed afterwards due to Harmony Gold realizing this loophole. But when I said the owners, I in specific mean Macross's creator Shoji Kawamori and the company Big West Frontier, who legally own, on an international level, everything Macross related. And Kawamori? He despises Harmony Gold on a visceral level, having legitimately called Robotech a plagiarized version of his work as he did not approve of the animation company Tatsunoko licensing the series to them. 
and hates how they have since actively prevented all of his creations from seeing wider release thanks to a court decision that said the animation company for Macross, Tatsunoko, had given Harmony Gold a master rights license when that was never the legal agreement, and that interpretation was later overturned. But Harmony Gold refused to acknowledge that. The primary reason there hasn't been more Macross projects is because of the distribution barricades Harmony Gold is solely responsible for, and has prevented them from getting any money for these works from the West. As contrary to what certain companies and idiot producers might claim, there is a lot to be made from exporting your products internationally, as long as they're being handled correctly and not deliberately being sabotaged in its export, as has been the problem with, say, Toei's handling of their internationally distributed items for some time now. And Kawamori's work has been prevented from having that happen through no fault of his own. It's easy to understand his bitterness as, I've watched fan subs of the Macross series we didn't get, and we missed out on some really cool stuff that would have been very well received had it gotten a chance at a wider audience with a dub and distribution. For other victims of Harmony Gold, they went after Transformers due to the character Jetfire having his design originally be based off of Macross Valkyrie as the toy likeness and figure had been licensed from Bandai to be part of Takara and Hasbro's original Transformers line. And Harmony Gold made that impossible and had them need to heavily redraw the animation model and discontinue production and sale of Jetfire's toy in American markets almost immediately as they got sued over it. Yes, Hasbro the company that had legally purchased the right to use the likeness and distribute the toy from the owners, got sued by someone who only bought a license for everything but that toy, despite Hasbro having purchased their rights first, thus had the precedent agreement. Even with the parent company's approval and backing on the matter, Transformers was forced to change it, get rid of the character, and lose his related toy because of Harmony Gold's legal bullshit. And Harmony Gold sued Hasbro any time Jetfire was given a new toy, until a court finally shut them down on it and found all of their suits collectively frivolous and without legal grounds from their start in the 80s. Again, the reversal from the suit I mentioned before, and dismissed the case with prejudice so they could never sue Hasbro again. And this only occurred in the middle of the 2010s, 30 years after they first started to do so. It's even worse when it came to the Battletech and MechWarrior franchise created by Fossa Corporation whose tabletop game modules and figures as well as video game tie-ins had originally licensed designs from Macross in an agreement that once more was directly with Tatsunoko themselves in getting their approval. And despite having that direct legal right from the original owners, like the Jetfire Mests, Harmony Gold once again overstepped and sued them for far longer than Hasbro suffered, resulting in the creation of the unseen mech line whose designs were no longer printed in modules or seen in their tie-in content. And Harmony Gold's lawsuits repeatedly put the owners of that property out of business. Battletech being sold off again and again with the lawsuits only to follow to the new holders. But once more, there is a happy ending, as after abusing left and right that license in order to drag out of their victims any penny they never rightfully earned themselves, they finally overstepped their bounds on suing Battletech's current rights holders and had their case thrown out with prejudice as they started claiming mech designs that did not come from Macross at all, and they had no legal right to. Which led to Battletech's owners then finally putting Harmony Gold's many, many lawsuits to rest permanently by getting the judge in the case to agree with the argument that as a distributor of the Macross content, they did not have any legal right to enforce ownership over it. Also known as the legal issue, all of this material has had problems with all these years which even Macross's owners directly said they did not and never had the right to enforce ownership over. If you've got the time to spare, check out the channel Gamers Tavern. They did a whole video on this mess. And those are just the big examples. Hell, you want to know why they sued everybody so frivolously? Because even when they lost the lawsuits, it was written into the contract with Tatsunoko that any legal expenses incurred as part of their enforcement of the content's copyright on their behalf would be automatically deducted from Harmony Gold's licensing costs. Meaning, due to how they spaced out said lawsuits, the right owners literally didn't get money from Harmony Gold over the license to Macross for decades. Once again, not a joke. Suffice to say, there is a legitimate reason why no one who has half a brain and is aware of how big a pile of scumbags Harmony Gold are actually wants any more Robotech content from them and want the company to finally die or lose their license so they can just go away and we can get the Macross content we were denied. 
and for a long time, it seemed like that was not going to happen. Thanks to idiots giving Harmony Gold money from their various crowdfunding campaigns, and Funimation agreeing to stream Robotech after their ability to sue anyone ever again was permanently destroyed, Harmony Gold got the money together to pay Tatsunoko the renewal fee for that license until at least 2054. Despite Tatsunoko not having the authority to give that to them again, and Matt Cross's actual owners, Big West Frontier, losing literally millions of American dollars thanks to Harmony Gold's contacts, preventing them from earning money from any other part of Macross. For all intents and purposes, Harmony Gold murdered two franchises and harmed multiple others because of licensing and royalties they weren't even paying for nor to the right people and still have no legal right to hold hostage. However, in April of 2021, it was announced that due to Harmony Gold's long-standing legal disputes, it was found that Harmony Gold actually did not have the right to deny Macross's import at all, as well Robotech is based on Macross, Macross itself has been recognized as a completely independent intellectual property to it, and they had no right to make any decisions about it at all, and a deal was worked out that as long as Big West Frontier did not interfere with Harmony Gold's attempts to make a live-action Robotech movie, which has been in development hell so long, the project is older than I am, they would no longer oppose Matt Cross and its sequel series from seeing unedited imports. This might seem like a win at long last, but we will see how that gets fucked over, as they do have a history of yanking people's chains and dangling this very thing in front of people's noses. Hell, you know how bad this feud is? Artists on Harmony Gold's payroll, literally to this day, steal Macross art assets that were made outside the confines of this deal, and even those made by fans, as they were made more recently than the assets they licensed. They have no legal right to those other artworks, yet because they share the designs going to court over them is an exercise in pulling teeth. There is a legitimate reason Shoji Kawamori despises them, and he's not worked with a single person from Tatsunoko since they fucked this all up, as they're the ones who screwed him and his work over by making the deal with Harmony Gold, who they didn't have the right to in the first place. And this all affected how Bandai has handled the Super Robot Wars games, as Macross was recurrently seen in it within the Super Robot Wars games of the 2000s. At the time, Bandai had their biggest Western content import boom, and thus was unable to capitalize on it due to Harmony Gold abusing their distribution license in ways they, as I just explained was proven in retrospect, legally had no right to, thus making for a climate where Bandai wrote off trying to put the games out there as a lost cause when they had otherwise worked out the rights mess to all the other licensees at the time. Harmony Gold was the one holdup, and because of them, Bandai never decided to import any of them. Thus, we lost out on a bunch of really cool-to-experience games. In specific, Super Robot Wars Alpha and its sequels, the DS Entry Double, and the Z subseries of games. The Z games in specific, to my understanding, are considered highly popular, at least the first and second entries of them. Ergo, the multiple sequels that mashed nearly every franchise featured in Super Robot Wars up to that point into it, and it is just disappointing we missed out on that by only a couple years, as they only began to see these English translated releases after Harmony Gold was permanently neutered from enforcing copyright from Japan's side for tie-in content. But also by that same token, the point Bandai just cut Macross off entirely from consideration for the games. Toxic capitalism standard operating procedure, ladies and gentlemen. This is why we can't have nice things. Now, why has this finally seemed to change and there are now English translated games of it floating around, starting with V of the main series and the Moon Dwellers for the OG Generation series? Outside of, like, one or two GBA games, they were able to get past this blockade out of nowhere. You know, years before Harmony Gold was finally blocked from screwing them over. Well, it's actually because Bandai of America, in specific, became legitimately that incompetent at video game imports. Screwing up with many Western-released exclusive game bugs or software problems, which dates back to the mid-2000s with the likes of Digimon World 4, as I have covered previously, or incomprehensibly bad translation and localization processes, which no one understands how it can be that badly done. And it got to the point where the game developers themselves in Japan had to call out Band of America for it in official press releases and interviews. So it reached the point that the company no longer had trust in them to do it right, 
and they began to produce international physical release versions of many of their games with the assistance of their Southern Asian divisions. Made up of countries where English is a prominent secondary language, thus making for easy accessibility across all of them. As for why this has happened beyond Bandai of America basically destroying the market for Bandai games in the first place in the West, it has to do with Japan's population decline and aggressive work schedules having tapped their core home demographic markets dry. So there is a wealth of games out there that need new market sources for the company to make ends meet. And thus, they have started to make it a staple that their games include either by default an English language option layered over the actual Japanese dialogue, or otherwise allow for a patch to be downloaded to get around their troublesome middlemen. Seen in the Nintendo Switch entry of Taiko no Tatsujin, and Kamen Rider Memory of Heroes. Thus, people who would be interested now can purchase them digitally, or from physical copies made available through import companies like Play Asia. Though this isn't exactly a new, new thing, but has only really expanded in recent years. Back during the PlayStation 3's tenure, if you played One Piece Pirate Warriors 1 or Dynasty Warriors Gundam Reborn, those were download-only games off of the PSN with no physical copy purchasable in the West, with only English subtracts translating the game's Japanese audio. Bandai of America did not distribute those games. Bandai of Hong Kong did, and put them on the PSN internationally after translating them. The Hong Kong, Indonesia, and Singapore divisions are the principal releasers of the Asia-English version of Bandai games in the past, and they've now become the spearhead for these English translation tracks, as Band of America can't be trusted to do jack-all without screwing it up. I have not found significant translation errors in any of the Asia-English releases I've seen. Though admittedly they do occasionally pop up, it is usually for minor things that screw up, say, an LR romanization or keep to the Japanese phonetic spelling. Just, you know, general nitpick stuff. But it is still in far less a quantity than the screw-up scene of the American localization teams and lacks the blind idiot localization, terminology screw-ups that make the story unintelligible, and examples of translators doing whatever the hell they want, regardless of if it conflicts with the intent or the core story, which I constantly complain about. So for those who have said I should shut up about calling out Band of America for their craptastic quality control and awful localization, yeah, the head branch has actually been doing it themselves for over half a decade now, and done so by showing everyone how the hell it should be done. This really should not be so hard to understand. If you're going to be assigned a professional job, we should expect a professional quality end result, or at the very least, close to it. And that includes listening to and performing quality control and correction. A lot of companies have been failing this in recent years, but we mostly did get good work from those working on these games as there's a reason beyond this that the game's translation is so good. Minus some minor hiccups where it's clear that they just missed context, such as when they accidentally made a lesbian character who was talking about her affections for a love interest substitute in male pronouns for her female paramour, some attack names being slightly off, misnaming the character LPO Puru as LPO Pla, while not understanding that her given name is also an autonomatopoeia for her laugh, so then they spell her laugh, pleh, 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 instead of <laughs> which, of course, makes no sense. Or what said an attack sequence on one stage being wrong, but it being right everywhere else you use it. But they got so much of it right beyond these clear misses of context or a programming bug because, as was revealed in a social media thread by the English translation team, those part of working on these games actually took the time to find as many of the series part of the games as possible, and sat down to watch what they could to make sure they got the lore, terminology, and voices of the characters as close to right as they could, and as a source of reference material to work with and check against. This is also why units such as the God Gundam and Devil Gundam from G Gundam use their English localization names of Burning and Dark Gundam respectively. The official English release, alongside their use of official romanizations and localizations, took precedent for the English tracks as is mandated by Bandai itself internally. The official English translations are always the ones that trump everything. But not all of these series have had official translations or releases, however. So for those, fan subs were used to fill the gaps. Though there is one exception to this where they did not appear to use the official romanizations. The imported release of King of Braves Gal Gygar is so long out of print that someone born after it was discontinued is entering high school now. 
Thus, it is normally impossible to find such without ridiculous markup. Most people thus have only seen the show through fan subs of it, or alternatively, DVD rips. But, if you can find it for a fair price, and by good fortune I did, you then have evidence from those DVDs of the only other major screw-up the translation team made, which, in the game, protagonist Guy Shishio's name is spelled as G-U-Y, instead of the official romanization of G-A-I. Now, admittedly, there is some legitimate confusion on how to spell Guy's name because he has a superhero alias that is Cyborg Guy, spelled G-U-Y, which makes use of the alliterative omonym name pun his given name can make use of, which has happened with other characters named Guy. Guy Maito in Naruto being a mighty guy, for example. But his superhero name is not his real name, nor the name the Super Robot Wars games generally make use of. The games do distinguish between the two names and identities, and generally kept to use of his real name, as the only time you ever see it ever written as Guy G.Y. in all media and merch for the series, is specifically in use of the phrase Cyborg Guy, or as he's known after he gets his end of series upgrades and in Gal Gygar final, Evoluter Guy, and nowhere else. And Media Blaster's original translation for the series actually did distinguish between the two spellings to make clear that there were two different contexts for you to use them in. So you write Guy, G-A-I, for his given name, and Guy, G-U-Y, for solely when the superhero name is being referenced, and the two are not the same, nor interchangeable. As if it was supposed to be Guy, G-U-Y the entire time, then the spelling of the main mech is in turn wrong, since Gal Geiger's name comes from the names of its component parts, including Guy himself, and yet the mech's name never ends up screwed up in any media I have ever seen. I will never understand why Guy G.Y. is such a common misromanization for Japanese characters named Guy G.A.I., outside of circumstances where the homonym pun is in use. Because the name Guy, spelled G.A.I., is actually a relatively common name in Japan. Hell, there are other characters named Guy in these games, and their names are all spelled correctly. And it would be hypocritical to be harsh to them about this when they otherwise did go through all this effort to do right by these series for just some minor mistakes and differences that have rational reasons for why they can and do exist, or possibly a faulty source as, hell, that's what I go through to make my presentations. And it's not like I've never messed up on accidents or by trusting something I shouldn't have that can trip up an otherwise honest attempt at a presentation. I know I tend to be a grump about these kinds of things, because normally it can be a sign of a professional translator being lazy or not knowing what they're doing, but from politely asking about this, I got a reasonable answer for everything, and honestly, sometimes that's all it takes. Thus, I am still looking forward to more translated Super Robot Wars projects now from this team, which we know are coming with the announcement of Super Robot Wars 30th Anniversary. Now, because this is the Asian English release, there is something you should know about them, or in specific, how DLC works for them. While the games I have are marketed as international copies, if you try to get DLC through a US or European PSN account, well, it won't work as the DLC isn't available on the PSN in major Western regions. Curse you, Region Lock DLC! You have no idea the horrors it's wrought on some games I want to play or get the DLC for. Case in point, the mess with Tales of Grazes and its Region Locked Haseo skin. Spoilers, trying to get the import DLC pack for that to work, which is actually possible, is why I haven't reviewed a Tales of game yet. At the moment, I kind of have to jailbreak my PS3 beforehand to set that up, and I don't want to break mine. There are, fortunately, two ways around this. The first is the easy option. The more recent Super Robot Wars games have been re-released on the, to the Nintendo Switch and Steam, with versions that do include all the DLC released. The other is a bit more involved. For the PlayStation 4 versions, you have to set up a South Asian PSN account. It is recommended you do one for Singapore, as that one is in English. Buy the DLC off of it with international PSN points cards you can get from other importers, such as the site Play Asia, where I get all my Asian English releases, and then set the Singapore account as it being a primary account on your console. This allows the other accounts equal access to that DLC by your main gaming account, so you can have everything saved the way it should be if you want to keep your account's trophy collection growing, or all your saved data stockpiled on one unified account in the event you need to transfer it. But, you might be wondering why I'm doing this, and, well, it's simple. I really like giant robots and series involving robots, and this is my opportunity to take some time to gush about my appreciation of them, 
and state some of my critiques and informed opinions, or spotlight content in the genre without having to go down the entire rabbit hole of reviewing series I consider to be garbage, insulting, or have an explicable hate them that bash a series they describe as different from what actually happened in the one they bash, or, in case of many series from the older days, do not have aged well at all. And I hope I can turn you guys onto some of these series you might have just not seen or playing these games yourselves, as I intend to review not just this year's follow of Super Wild Wars V, but X and T as well in the coming year to share my enjoyments and frustrations with the series involved. Who knows, maybe at the end of this I will be able to do Super Wild Wars 30th anniversary as well. And as such, before we get started on these, I would like to list off a few series I would like to see featured in a main series game at some point in the future some of which already have been seen in previous Super Robot Wars games, or on their mobile games Cross Wars Omega or DD. Others, well, they're unlikely to make it into a mainline title, but i just like to see it regardless, and I'm just throwing it up there. Number 1. Fooly Cooly. This should be an no-brainer, especially now that there's been two expansions to this OVA series from Gainax, even if Fooly Cooly alternate sucks. But I could see an easy adaptation of content from the original and progressive runs into the working framework of a Super Robot Wars amalgamated setting, with Haruko Haruhara's anti-hero hunt for Atomus' power against the evil Medical Mechanica, who wants to remove all thought from the universe doing well as a Super Robot Wars set piece or backdrop, especially with Fooly Cooly's Mecha. And before people ask, yes, Mecha and robots featured in Super Robot Wars have gotten this small and been counted before. Hell, Super Robot Wars mobile game features content from Scryde, and has its protagonist that can create support robots and armor they fuse with, with the power of their minds, be playable characters. If they can do that, then Haruka, Conti, and even Hidomi's armored form would be excellent characters to see featured, especially since Gainax series are constant staples of the Super Robot Wars series. Take, take the time! Number 2, Tekaman Blade. Tekaman Blade, in its American import as Technoman, is my gateway anime and first series I watched when it was brought over and dubbed, and has seen feature in Super Robot Wars before. It is a series that can function well alongside several series, such as Gundam 00, as it involves an alien invasion of Earth, and one of their victims getting armored power from their usual system and infesting their enemies against them to fight back. Considering the story of several Super Robot series also feature alien invasions to varying degrees, it has and will continue to mesh well with a return visit for the franchise. I just really want to see it again in an entry where I can actually play it. Number 3. Pirate Sentai Gokaiger one of the series featured in Super Robot Wars Cross Omega, along with a few other Super Sentai series atop it, Gokaiger's gimmick of using the powers of past heroes would give them amazing versatility and a wealth of super attacks to showcase along the lines of spotlighting a bit of everything. And one of the most consistent delivers of giant robots on TV over the last 45 years is Super Sentai. So it would honestly be better than any other option to represent the franchise in Super Robot Wars. All it would take is the permission to use the actor's likeness rights in redrawing their appearance for the character models beyond their appearance in their transformed state. Hell, go one step further and have their Gokai Galleon classified as a battleship unit in order to balance its various combination power utilization gimmicks. I honestly could see it working in all this. It would just take Toei agreeing to do it. And that isn't as out there as you might think. The Kamen Rider, Ultraman, and Gundam franchises were all featured together in a previous Ben Presto game. Great Battle Full Blast in 2012, and they have already allowed their use in Cross Wars Omega as it is. A mainline game isn't that far out there for this. Number 4, Outlaw Star. My favorite anime of all time, I am surprised hasn't gotten the spotlight. The Outlaw Star works as a battleship unit, and its grappler combat moves and speedy traversing of space makes it fit with a special class unit. And there's again precedent from Super Robot Wars T, including Cowboy Bebop and its story that would make it work. 
Outlaw Star is from that same era, had a paralleling level of popularity, and if need be, could even feature the members of the crew have an attack where they dive out of the ship to pull off special attacks. And for people going against the possibility of seeing that, I once again proof this against existing franchises that have gotten use that that is not out of the ordinary to see. Outlaw Star works in an amalgamated setting where the Earth's influence over space has collapsed, potentially tied into any of the non-universal century Gundam timelines where it's gone a bit backwards in progress, such as G-Reco, or even better, Turnate Gundam or Gundam X, thus allowing the rest of the galaxy to flourish in its absence. Once more, something Super Robot Wars has done before, with the Outlaw Star elements thus allowing use of a searching through the universe story to possibly restore Earth, all of the power and influence of the galactic ley line. Number 5, the Zone of the Enders franchise. Because it's freaking Zone of the Enders. While it is a Konami product not owned by Bandai, once again, Bandai not owning a product is not necessarily a limitation to preventing their appearance, as happened with Zoids that are owned by Takara in a game that featured them. It would just require Konami getting on board with the idea of allowing someone else to use a property of theirs that they literally do not give a damn about, and allowing them to get kicked back for the first time in a while from what is literally one of the best mecha combat games and related anime ever made. Six, the Gundam Build Fighters and Build Diver series, as well as Iron Blooded Orphans. They are currently the only series that have not gotten representation in Super Robot Wars at all, to my knowledge. The build subset of series I'm surprised haven't been given a spotlight yet, even if they are recent. Though with how awesome Gundam Build Divers Re-Rise was, I expect to get a spotlight sooner or later. Fighters and Re-Rise themselves include isekai narratives that would allow the crossing over of different universal settings as required. And the Build Fighter Battlelog and Diver series included the concept of including AI recreations of franchise characters. And with Re-Rise going full isekai, where VR characters are transmitted and allowed to be fully realized projections of themselves, and the custom mecha thanks to the mechanics of a benevolent being on another world, that could work for allowing the amalgamation of any Super Robot Wars featured series through use of such projection AI and unintentionally ravaged by data from the game backflowing into this setting, and it leads alongside the AI recreations having to set it all right again. There's a lot that could be done with this. Iron Blood Orphans is even easier, as multiple Super Robot Wars games, including the most recent 1T, have used Mars as a setting piece, so it is easy to start off the IBO story and allow its integration. It legitimately meshes well with the backstory elements of Martian successor Nagesico, and Bandai for some reason loves spamming that Studio Zebek produced series in these games. Number 7 A lot of people have been suggesting it, and since my roommate showed me some of its content, well, let's just say that while well, this is a Magitech Magical Girl series where the Gil wielders are powered up by music, their power tier scaling goes through the roof. And even by episode 13 out of 65, there are characters among the cast that can not only crack the moon, but pull a broken chunk of it out of orbit. Considering the size of some of their enemies and powered armor like their equipped forms have made it into the Super Robot Wars games before in the forms of Tech Man Blade and Scryde, again the latter in Cross Omega, it actually fits that they could show up in an entry. <laughs> And number 8, Gridman, both the original and 4S variants, as well as Dyna Xenon, for similar reasons to Gokaiger, would work well here. Power armor as Gridman equips through his varied incarnations, as addressed before, is counted as robot-like enough to count for the purpose of Super Robot Wars, 
And similar to the Build Fighters examples, there are circumstances between the story mashups that would allow a character that is primarily an AI or based in virtual reality to emerge or be present in a physical setting. As series with just that happening has actually already happened in Super Robot Wars history as well. Clearly, it worked best in amalgamation with the Build Diver series, but there are ways that it could come about on its own, especially since the original Gridman ended on the main antagonist of it attempting to emerge out into reality. It just takes one step further to make that and his appearances as such that reality. And the thing about all these suggestions is... None of them are that unrealistic, as Bandai and Banpresto do have a history of going all out and getting the rights to feature what they can. It's part of why there has been such a licensing hang-up for their imports. And regardless of whether they happen in the future, or whether they just get into the mobile games, Super Robot Wars is a property that keeps as much of the mecha genre alive and in people's minds with the recreations of popular stories and spotlight of series and characters. Now, if only they would focus on the Universal Century less, as their use of those properties actively prevents them from using so many series that deserve their own proper showcase that would be more possible if they gave the UC series a rest for a few entries. With all that said, let's begin with Super Robot Wars V. The Earth faces annihilation from invaders beyond the stars. Left with no options as the human race's endeavors collapse, all focus is given upon their final hope, a message sent that may permit them salvation if they can manage a trip across the cosmos itself. Allies found amidst the outer planets that embody the spirit of unyielding rebellion rally behind them, garnering a force that may yet turn the tide against the enemies of galactic peace. And among the crew, a pilot falls into a machine forgotten to time, uncovering a secret that may save them all. Next time in Super Robot Wars V, Towards a Sea of Stars, System 99, The Crossbone Vanguard, and The Last Hopes of a Dying World. There are 300 days until the extinction of the human race.